LDL cholesterol had no bearing. Uh, high or low made no difference to heart attack, stroke, death. I mean, probably if you're smoking three packs of cigarettes a day, that's probably what's driving the heart disease, not the fact that you're eating butter and eggs. So we talked about high cholesterol. Let's talk about low cholesterol. There are studies that show that people with low cholesterol have certain higher rates of certain cancers. They're more likely to have infections. They are more likely to develop dementia. They are more likely to have depression, more likely to be violent. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching our videos. If you'd like to support us some more, you can explore our homemade natural skincare products at purelytallow.com. Thank you so much for supporting my small business. Hey everybody, welcome to the Carnivore Revolution. I'm Serena, and today my guest is Dr. Sean Baker. Sean Baker is a renowned medical doctor and orthopedic surgeon, an athlete, and an advocate for the carnivore diet with a passion for health and nutrition and is a best-selling author. Dr. Sean Baker, thank you so much for making the time for me today. Well, hey, thanks for having me. Hey, thanks for having uh, an audience that might have some interest in this stuff. So appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like the more times we do this, the more times that we talk to each other, the more people we're going to hit with this information. And I just feel like that's so important because like you and I were talking off camera about how people think we're nuts, right? People think this is crazy. So let's start with how you became crazy. <laughs> like what happened with you? Where were you in life that you just said, you know what? I'm just going to eat meat from now on. Yeah, well, I mean, I was uh, about five years into a sort of a health journey. I mean, you know, if you, if you back up to the time I was maybe 42, 43, um, I was working as a surgeon, very busy, still an athlete. I still literally was, you know, had won a world championship in Highland Games, you know, uh, but a big, I was a big guy, I was 285 pounds, big, strong guy, trained a lot, ate a lot, you know, but but was clearly not metabolically as healthy as I could have been for sure. I mean, I was still able to perform pretty well as an athlete, but I just was not particularly healthy. And so I decided, you know, there was a point where, hey, it's enough is enough. I don't need to be 290, 300 pounds anymore. Uh, and so I started just, you know, evolving uh, my diet, I kept training hard, lost weight, the typical way that most people tell you to. I cut calories, I ate lower fat, I ate a lot of vegetables, ate a lot of lean protein. It did work. I did lose weight. I got lean. Uh, however, <laughs> I felt absolutely miserably hungry and grouchy, and I didn't like it. I didn't like the way I felt. I didn't. I knew it wasn't sustainable. I looked pretty good, but I was like, yeah, this is this is not. I can't do this." Which I think is a problem for a lot of people. You know, we hear this diet, eat this diet of whole grains and lean protein and lots of leafy, non-starchy vegetables. That's the mantra we keep hearing, but it is extremely hard for most people to sustain, including myself. So then I started to really care about nutrition. I was like, I, I can't do this. I got to eat something the rest of my life and I can't do this. And so I started looking into, at that time, this is back in, oh, 2012-ish or something like that. Paleo was quite popular. Uh, I transitioned to that, found it, you know, I enjoyed the food a little bit more. Uh, keto then started to become more popular, looked into that. I started doing it. And then, you know, and then I had a revolution, you know, it's sort of insight, a kind of a revolutionary insight to me that for the first time in my life, I wasn't really hungry which I thought was really weird because I had always been a guy that was constantly eating because I needed to be. I mean, I was, you know, almost 300 pounds and training really hard and was always eating and always thinking about eating and always pre preparing food and thinking about what restaurant I was going to go to on Friday night and blah, blah, blah. And that was, that was pretty typical for me. And then I started to like, wait a minute, I'm not hungry. I'm not, I don't, I, for the first time I lunch, I didn't like, I wasn't worried about lunch. I was sitting in the operating room, not thinking about food, you know, cause you're in there and you're in a long case, you're doing a, you know, two hour joint replacement. You're like, oh, God, God damn it. Let me get through this case so I can eat. You know I mean? It's yeah. just, you know, so then it just so happened that, um, at that time, all the orthopedic surgeons in the local community were getting frustrated operating on all these obese patients because yeah. was, obese patients are technically harder to operate on. They're more prone to get complications. And so we, we kind of said, Hey, look, we are not going to offer this these types of surgeries to obese people until they've had an opportunity to lose weight. We want their BMI to be under 35, so 35 is class two obesity. And, you know, it was like, okay, so you're all left to your devices to make them lose weight. And there was a bariatric surgeon in town, but he was overloaded. There's no way he could take care of all the patients that needed weight loss surgery to get them ready for surgery. So um, at that time I was doing a ketogenic diet and I said, well, I'm gonna try this on my patients because I had had good success. And, you know, maybe one out of five patients would, would actually try it. Most people would say, I don't want to change my diet. But mm -hmm. of, the, of the folks that would do it, they would come back to me two weeks later because I would say, hey, try this diet. Come back in two weeks. Let's see how you're doing. Mm -hmm. And a surprisingly high percentage of those people that I had had on the surgery to replace their knee or their hip or whatever would come back to me and say, hey, doc, you know what? I haven't really lost much weight yet, but my knee doesn't hurt anymore. 
And I would say, well, that's interesting. That's curious. Yeah. Well, if your knee doesn't hurt, then the indication for surgery is not really there anymore. And and then so we started canceling surgeries. And so that, that got me down that rabbit hole. I was keto for about three years. And then I discovered these wacko, crazy, nutty people doing an all meat diet. This was the zeroing in on health group, Charles yeah. Washington, Kelly Hogan, you know, Kelly mm -hmm. thing, on and on. I ran into those guys. And I, and I just kind of with morbid fasc fascination read through their, I think it was a Facebook page. And I was like, these people are nuts, right? But but it was so intriguing that after about six months of kind of lurking and reading and asking a few questions, I finally tried it myself. And this was 2016. I, I started with just like my toe in the water. I had one meal. I'd steak and eggs for breakfast one day and I didn't have toast and juice and fruit right. or whatever I was eating at the time. And I was like, yeah, that's pretty good. I enjoyed it. I didn't, I didn't really miss the other stuff. And then I got, then I got to the courage to do it for a day and then three days and then a week and then two weeks. And then at the end of 2016, I did it for 30 days. And I was like, really impressed by how good I actually felt. All my digestive stuff, stuff that I had thought was just normal digestive stuff that, cause I'd had it my whole life. I thought that right. that's just digestion, you know, a little bit of bloating, a little bit of gas, a little bit of, you know, like kind of almost reflux. Mm -hmm. I thought that was normal or my normal. Anyway. And then I realized, wait a minute, I don't even know I'm digesting anything, which I thought was really kind of interesting yeah. to me. And then really important to me as an orthopedic surgeon is, you know, I remember I was squatting 500 pounds one time and I think I, you know, I had an injury and I think I maybe partially uh, injured my quadriceps tendon and I had nagging tendonitis my whole life. I mean, for, for at least 10 years. And every time I sat down in a car for a long ride, my knee would be aching. If I sat in a movie theater, my knee would be aching. And I had tried everything I knew as an orthopedic surgeon to relieve and it never went away. So I just accepted it. That's just me. That's just part of aging. Mm -hmm. And, you know, right. it sucked as an athlete because, you know, there were days when I wanted to train my legs, for instance, like, like a run sprints and I couldn't because my knee hurt. So two months into this diet, that went away for the first time in 10 years. And that really, that really got my attention yeah. and it's never come back by the way. It's been, that was eight years ago. It's never come back. And so, uh, that's what got me into this stuff. So this is, you know, all hat, you know, hats off and thanks to Kelly and Charles Washington and Charlene and Joe Anderson's and all those guys that were kind of doing this stuff back before anyone had ever heard of this stuff. It wasn't even called a carnivore diet back then. It was called, I think they called it a zero carb diet. And, you know, I, I basically said, well, you know, when I wrote my book and I you know, I, I had gotten asked on Rogan's podcast back in 2017, about a year after I'd started. And of course that kind of blew things up a little bit. A lot of people yeah. said, what the hell is he crazy? Just a thing? little. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I, and I, didn't, I really didn't understand the impact that Rogan had at the time. He was still very popular, not, you know, not to the degree he is now, but I mean, he was yeah. still quite powerful then. And so that got me on the radar of a lot of people and a, a publisher asked me to write a book about it. And I had no intention of writing a book. I'm not an author. I don't like, I don't even yeah. like writing, you know, I was like, I don't really like writing, but, uh, but it's, I wrote it, you know, it turned out, you know, it turned out it's actually selling really well and it's done well. And it seems to be pretty, pretty people have had a good response to it, but, but yeah, that's my, that's the sort of the origin story for me, I suppose. Yeah. I will say that the Joe Rogan podcast didn't just get, didn't just bring a little bit of attention. I would say 90% of the people that I talked to originally heard about the carnivore diet from the Joe Rogan podcast with Dr. Sean Baker on it. Yeah, so. either me or Jordan Peterson or Michaela. I mean, I went on first and then Michaela saw it. And I think she says it myself and maybe Kelly Hogan mm -hmm. sort of influenced her to do it. And then of course she influenced her dad and her dad already had a yeah. huge following. So when he did it, you know, you can see this huge spike yeah. like on Google Trends in, in 2018. Like I was in at the end of 2017 and then, then 2018 they were on. Yeah. So this big jump goes up in 2018 when, when people had first okay. heard about this. And then you know, and then of course we had all the, you know, every vegan on the planet come out and started attacking everybody. And then it's been, you know, back and forth, but it, it's steadily, uh, in, you know, growing and growing and growing, as you know, everybody, I mean, yeah. gosh, you can't turn around and not see carnivore Jim and carnivore John and carnivore Jane mm -hmm. and everybody's got a carnivore channel. You know? It's yeah. just like all well, these people are doing yeah. this stuff now. And it's and, because it works, right? Yeah. I, mean, I think, yeah, right. Yeah. And it's about helping people and saving people. So let's get down to the nitty gritty now and talk about the thing that is the top of the mind first question that everybody asks when you say, I'm doing the carnivore diet or I just eat meat and eggs is cholesterol. Mm -hmm. Now, that is everybody's biggest concern cholesterol, heart disease. Oh my goodness, you're going to have a heart attack. You're going to die. Don't you go to the doctor. You better go to the hospital. You better have your cholesterol checked. Let's talk about cholesterol. Why is it not an issue? if we eat lots of meat and lots of fat and eggs? Well, I'm, I'm not the guy saying it's not an issue. First of all, let me be very okay. clear about that. It may not okay. be an issue. I mean, I think that's a fair to say because okay. I think that um, not everybody that goes carnivore sees their cholesterol go up. Some do right. and ma many do. And, and it's interesting, you know, as, as you know, as you probably are aware of Dave Feldman and, and some of his work, you know, and some Nick Norwich 
and Matt Budoff and some of these other people have now sort of started to investigate this so-called lipid energy model. And so what they're seeing is, you know, particularly if you lose weight or losing weight or are already lean, then those are the people more likely to see rises in both LDL cholesterol, total cholesterol, HDL, and then also ApoB, because people are saying, what about ApoB? Really, I mean, you can think about ApoB the same way you think about LDL. If LDL goes up high, your ApoB is going to go up high. I mean, they, they go in the same direction, you know. There's some slight differences, but it's essentially, anybody says, well, it's all about ApoB. It's it's really the same. It's kind of the same stuff, to, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And the question is the reason for it going up. You know, is there a physiologic reason for LDL cholesterol to go up. Well, the lipid energy model says so, and I think it's it's holding up under test. And so there's been mm -hmm. several tests uh, that show that. So for instance, when, uh, you know, there's Adrian Sotomoda, who's a, who's a PhD from Oxford now, at, now, at, um, now he's in Mexico City, but he shows or showed that there's a meta-analysis of 41 randomized control trials that shows that people on low-carb diets that get particularly lean tend to have that response where the LDL cholesterol goes up. And it makes sense. In the, in the sense that as my body, my overall energy stores, whether it be liver glycogen or fat, are getting less and less, you know, as I'm getting, I'm having less energy stored in my cells, my cells need more. They're hungry now. Right. They were, they were like full, they were full fat cells before. And they're like, I don't need any more food. And all the food you get it, you, sh you, 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 you swallow, doesn't really get into the cells. It kind of raises your, your circulating, uh, um, energy. So it's interesting. It's just like a diabetic, you know, a diabetic, you know, we see, it's interesting. We see now with athletes, high level, uh, you know, athletes, a lot of times they run higher glucose and it's like, are they sick? Are they, are they diabetic? And, and they don't seem to have diabetic pathophysiology disease. It's because their cells are screaming for energy to support their, their muscles, their, 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 their high level of output. And so their, their liver is constantly cranking out you know, glucose from, from, uh, hepatic glycogenolysis, right? So the liver is breaking down its glycogen to fuel those muscles. So they might see higher levels of, of overall trafficking uh, of glucose and they've got more muscle mass, more active muscle mass. So they need more energy. It's the same thing that happens in a person who is low carb has depleted the energy in their body. And now because they're not consuming carbohydrates, the liver is left with one option. Really? I need to, I need to flow fat. Right. This is a lipid energy model. And we see that in the, you know, like in animals, like in bears are a classic example, a hibernating bear. We'll see its LDL, we'll see its total cholesterol go above 400 for six months. We'll be sit there with 400 cholesterol, six months. Bears never get heart disease. It's like, well, they spend half their time with super dangerous high LDL cholesterol. And, you know, it's like, well, why is that? Well, it's physiologically makes sense. What are the bears eating when they're hibernating? They're eating their own body fat. There's no, right. there's no carbs going in, right? There's, there, that's, that's gone in a day or two. So the bears are circulating more lipid energy due to that requirement. And the only place they can get it from is their body fat. Just like somebody on a, on a ketogenic or a carnivore diet, body fat is being broken down and utilized. It goes through the liver, the liver repackages it and shuttles it out in the form of uh, lipid energy, right? So cholesterol shows up as part of that. And the other thing, there's a drug out there. There's a class of drugs called the SGLT2 inhibitors. You know, these are, these are the drugs that make you pee off all your glucose, a diabetic drug. Uh, I think Genuvia and some of these other drugs. And so um, what happens is, you know, you, you eat all this carbohydrate, you pee off all the glucose, so your glucose is nice and low, but guess what happens to your LDL cholesterol? It goes up, right? For the same probably reason, because now all that energy that your body would have gotten from glucose is going in the toilet. So your liver says, well, we better send out some more fat. And guess what happens to heart disease risk in that situation in those patients on SGLT2 inhibitors? It goes down, right? Mm -hmm. So their glucose is lower, their cholesterol is higher, and their cardiovascular risk is lower. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a low-carb diet, right? I mean, it's kind of the right. same scenario. So, I mean, I can't say with 100% certainty that high cholesterol in the context of a ketogenic or carnivore diet is something we can completely ignore. But the data is starting to look more and more like that may, may be so, particularly in people that become metabolically healthy. Now, there's a transition phase. If you, I mean, if you're like hugely obese and diabetic and hypertensive and, and inflamed, mm -hmm. And, and, you know, and your cholesterol is super high, yeah, you're, you're probably still at risk at that point. But as you get better and you get rid of all those other risk factors the, and, and you're left with nothing, but the only thing that's a problem is high cholesterol, right. then that situation is, well, we don't know. And, and, and this is a, the uh, importance of Dave and Matt Budoff's study, you know, the lean mass hyperresponder, which has been done. The study has been done. The data has been collected. They're, they're, they're analyzing the data right now. Hopefully it'll be published sometime, maybe this summer I'm, I'm anticipating, and then we'll have more insight. I mean, it goes with the, the Western Heart, the Danish Western Heart, uh, sorry, the Danish Heart Registry study. It was done by Mortensen in 2020, 
2023 or 2022, I think it was 2022 and a 2022, where they showed that people with a zero CAC score, LDL cholesterol had no bearing, zero bearing, high high LDL, low cholesterol, uh, high, high or low, made no difference to, you know, what's called MACE, major adverse cardiac event, heart attack, stroke, death, uh, need for revascularization procedure. So, so there does seem to be some level of dependency. That is to say that LDL cholesterol is a dependent variable, and it depends on what? Well, in my view, it depends on your overall metabolic health. If you're metabolically healthy, then the argument could be made that um, LDL cholesterol is not as problematic in that situation. Now, obviously, if you want to sort of give yourself more comfort, get some kind of imaging, CAC score, you know, you know CT angiography, if you want to, if you, if you feel you want to do that, although there's risks associated with that. That's why, you know, because the criticism of, of a CAC scanner is, well, it doesn't show soft plaque. Well, you know, but if you've got a zero CAC score, the likelihood of you having soft plaque if you're asymptomatic is pretty darn low, right? It's, right. it's, it's generally pretty low. Um, so my, my answer to that is, you know, don't just ignore LDL cholesterol. Mm -hmm. You should just say, okay, give me more information, and then I can make these decisions. And, you know, particularly, if you just had a heart attack. My gosh, right. you just had a heart attack. You know you've got mm -hmm. all the risk factors that that right. that leave you uh you know vulnerable to heart disease and so so the, you know the, the cardiology answer is well we know ldl cholesterol is a risk factor for heart disease and if we bring it down to zero then the risk of heart heart disease is pretty darn low so there's some people that still have heart disease with, with effectively zero ldl but you can you can li literally lower that risk very low but the analogy is and this is a little bit of a crude analogy but if I am worried about, say, sexually transmitted diseases, you know, if I cut off my genitals, well, that, that decreases the likelihood of me having a sexually transmitted disease quite, quite significantly, although there's some downside to that, you know, so it's kind of like, you know, why are we lowering this LDL cholesterol to, right. they, they, they talk about neonate, neonates, you know, a baby is born with an LDL cholesterol of about 20 to 40, right? Really, really low. You never see that in adults. But guess what? Soon as a baby breastfeeds, within, within, about, a, within about two, three months, their LDL cholesterol is between 180 and 250, right? Total cholesterol. So are you telling me now that breast milk is atherogenic? Right. That doesn't make sense. You know, it's just, yeah. it's just, it just doesn't make any sense to me at all. So it's interesting. Yeah. And I think it's important to note what you said. So if your cholesterol is the only marker, then you probably have nothing to worry about. Obviously you have to do what makes you comfortable, but if everything else is good, you're metabolically healthy, your blood pressure is good. And what happens is you start a lower carb diet or a very low carb diet like carnivore or a clean keto diet, all of those other things start to get better anyway for most people. And so giving it a chance certainly isn't going to hurt you for 30 days. You can watch all of those other things get better. And then if you're just left with high cholesterol, that's not really, that's not really a terrible marker, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, I don't want to give people the idea that you're bulletproof with yes, high right. LDL on, on a low carb diet. You could be, I mean, mm -hmm. but I mean, I, you just need more information. And, and, you know, people like, I always get people sending me on social media, their lab. Hey doc, what do you think of these labs? And like, I don't know you. I don't know anything about right. you. I don't know what else is going on. I can't really comment intelligently right. about this stuff. I will yeah. say that, you know, if your LDL cholesterol is high, it could be a problem, but it might right. not be. But, but, you know, I think that's, I think that's a fair statement. I mean, there are people out there that'll say, LDL cholesterol is high. LDL cholesterol is always a problem in every single creature right. that walks the earth, every human that walks the earth. There's no exception to this. And yet mm -hmm. there are people that live to 90, 100 years old and have high LDL cholesterol. And of course, there's all the associative data with, you know, people that live over 100, their cholesterol tends to be on the higher side. And they always sort of, I don't know, they sort of play that away as, you know, it's reverse causality or mm -hmm. something, something, something. And, and I, I'm not really satisfied with the answers I get around that. Oh, the Mendelian randomization, you know, and it's like, well, right. that has flaws too. It's not, that's not bulletproof, uh, uh, right. you know, studies as either. So. Yeah. And the other thing is uh, the cholesterol testing is very subjective, right? I mean, it basically does um, an average of your cholesterol and it can change from day to day, from meal to meal. You did an experiment recently where you um, tested your cholesterol and then you worked out and you were fasted and you were able to change your cholesterol numbers, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, it is. It is a very interesting concept because, and this is what I always sort of almost cringe about when, when somebody go to the doctor and they'll say, Hey, you know, your total cholesterol is 210. Let's put you on, you know, let's put you on a statin or some other drug, you know, equivalent drug for the rest of your life. Often. Right? It's like, it's like, wait a minute. <clears throat> that's off one, yes. one lab reading. You're on a drug for the rest of your life. Yeah. And to, to that point, I mean, I would literally, I had a home cholesterol meter, which they're actually pretty, pretty accurate. I mean, they're within like 90, 95% accurate. Most of them have been tested, you know, repeatedly against 
lab day, you know, commercial labs. And so I tested it on day one and it was 154 total cholesterol. So that's mm -hmm. like most people, most cardiology. Oh, that's great. That's awesome. Yeah. Great job. You right. know, it's where you want it to be. Sweet spot. Often they would leave me alone. 18 right. hours later, after I had worked out and fasted an additional, mm -hmm. you know, 14, 15 hours, my cholesterol, total cholesterol is now 346, right? up almost 200 points in under 24 hours. Yeah. If they saw that lab, they would be like, oh my God, we need to put you, get you a cardiology consult stat, put you in, get you in the cath lab, you know, right. it's crazy. Yeah. So it's just like, there is, there can be a lot of dynamic variability in these labs, you know? And so it's like making these long-term decisions based on one single lab, which we know changes all the time or can change all the time. Right. To me, it's vanity in, in a lot of ways. And and again, it makes sense with this lipid energy. Model. Why did my cholesterol go up? Because I hadn't eaten and my cells right. were hungry and I don't have a bunch of glycogen. I don't have a bunch of liver glycogen. I'm not full up of carbohydrates. So my liver's like, okay, let's feed this guy. Let's feed up, feed all his muscle cells and skin cells and liver cells and heart cells. Boom. Here's all this fat. Yeah. So, I mean, it makes sense physiologically. And, you know, it's interesting. I had a CAC score back when I was uh, 51. It was zero. Good. That's great. I'm having another one tomorrow, in fact. I won't schedule tomorrow. So very cool. Uh, we'll see. I hope it's still zero. Maybe it won't be, but we'll have to yeah. see. So it'll be interesting. But, but that's the way I'm approaching it. I think, you know, kind of trust but verify type of thing. You know, it's a quote. I think maybe it was Reagan that said that. You know, it's kind of, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm pretty confident. I mean, I know, like, I, you know, like I just mentioned, I'm breaking world records on a rowing machine. That's not consistent with heart disease. I mean, I've right. got, a, you know, very high VO2 max. I'm, you know, I, 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 my blood pressure is low. My pulse is low. I work well. I mean, every, you know, I mean, it, it just doesn't, it's not consistent with me filling up with cholesterol and plaque and it just doesn't make sense. But, um, you know, I mean, sure. I mean, there'll, there'll be people that will point out, oh, I knew this really fit guy that dropped, dropped out of a heart attack. Yeah, that right. happens. Yeah. But it's it's the that's newsworthy when it does happen. Right. Most people that go to a cath lab or in a cardiology clinic are big fat people or, you know, most of them. Or, they got, or they're skinny fat, one or the other. I mean, it's just, it's not usually the fit, lean athlete that is dropping dead of heart attacks typically. That's, that's, right. uh, that's, a, that's an anomaly. Yeah. Absolutely. And you mentioned um, an infant earlier in their cholesterol levers. And I, I think it's important to note for people who don't know that when a baby is in the womb, the baby is in ketosis. And so this kind of leads leads me to believe anyway that this is our normal state is to be in ketosis because a baby in the womb is in ketosis while they are growing and turning into a human being. And then when they are born, they are in ketosis. When they are breastfeeding, they are in ketosis. And then we break it at like six or seven months old with a banana or with some, you know, some Gerber oatmeal out of a jar. Um, and that's when the carbohydrate addiction starts. And it's so important to just remember that when a child is learning at the fastest pace that they'll learn their entire lives, like when they're an infant, right? That's when they are in ketosis. That's when they are learning. Like what makes us think that is not our normal state? Just like for the naysayers, I just think that's important to note because so many people think ketosis is bad. And I think it's just important to note that that is our original state when we are born and when we are growing. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's interesting. If you look at like, there's a nice study on mammalian weaning times and it looks at it compared to all the different mammals. And they said, you know, trying to predict the diet our energy requirements and what's available naturally. Um, and, you know, when we look at human weaning, you know, humans have very big brains. We breastfeed from a, from a, compared to other primates, we breastfeed for a very short period of time, right? right. It's like on average, you know, like a, an, an indigenous human being uh, is breastfed for about two and a half years. You know, this is not, you know, this is not what we do in society. Most, you know, most women one year, six months, something like right. that. Mm -hmm. And then we put them on baby form, you know, rice cereal and all that stuff. Right. And th the only reason we can do that now is because we have all these powders and high energy processed foods that these kids can eat that, that supply the energy that they would otherwise get mm -hmm. from breast milk. But if you're in the wild and you're living out in the jungle or wherever, uh, you know, in the savannah or in the, you know, the forest, the only place high energy foods that allow for enough brain growth growth to occur naturally are animal fats, animal, you know, animal fats. So, I mean, yes, I mean, if they have predictive models that said, okay, they weaned at this age and their brain got this big, this is how much energy they need. And this is the diet they would have to do that on. And so for instance, like an orangutan who has a much, much smaller brain than us, you know, 300 cc's compared to our, you know, our 12, 13, 1400 cc brain, they, they breastfeed for eight years. Wow. And still they got this little tiny pea brain. And then their diet is, you know, fruits and leaves and crap like that. And it doesn't grow their brain anymore. So, I mean, it's very much, we got to get energy from somewhere. In historically, it's been animal fats, 
now modern days, it's like ground up grains, high energy, high surface area, high, high energy rich foods, which we're not designed for. And so the baby gets colicky and starts, you know, it's like you know, fussy, grouchy baby with, with rashy baby. All this stuff is probably secondary to the fact that they're eating you know, stuff that they're not well adapted to. And they, they have to sort of, you know, we hear about, you know, vegetables are acquired taste. You, know? yeah. so you give any kid a piece of broccoli or spinach, and they're like, you're spitting that stuff out. They're, they're saying, I'm not eating that stuff. I know we should go with our gut instinct there. So we talked about high cholesterol. Let's talk about low cholesterol. We have all of these um, older adults, you know, even people your age and my age taking statins, trying to lower your cholesterol. They put us on a low fat diet, but every cell in our body needs the fat and cholesterol. Our brains need the cholesterol. So what kind of things happen if we do too much of that and our cholesterol goes too low? I've seen studies of Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson's disease with higher instances of those and people with low cholesterol yet we just keep trying to lower people's cholesterol. Yeah, it's 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 interesting. You know, the the, the rationale is this condition, it's a genetic condition called A beta lipoproteinemia, where they say there are people that have genetically very, very low cholesterol, you know, super low levels, you know, 20, 30, 40 milligrams per deciliter, and they have a normal life expectancy. However, they those people do have some issues. And there is, again, albeit this is associative data, so you have to take that with a grain of salt, but there are studies that show that. People with low cholesterol have certain higher rates of certain cancers. They're more likely to have infections. They are more likely in some studies to develop dementia. They are more likely uh, to have depression. They are more likely to, to be suicidal. They're more likely to be violent. Uh, you know, there's animal studies, they're like primate studies. If you give a primate a lo very low cholesterol diet, they become incredibly violent. So there are potential problems with lowering these cholesterol levels down really low. Uh, low levels, either whether it's through diet or through pharmacotherapy or drugs. And so I don't know. We'll see what happens. You know, there's there, there's actually people talking about cholesterol lowering vaccines, which would permit like like genetic vaccines, which would permanently just permanently do away with your ability to raise your cholesterol levels up, which oh could be goodness. could be disastrous. I don't know who would sign up for that, but I mean Yeah, that's insane. You know, when we know cholesterol is so important that our body actually makes some cholesterol you know, how could that be bad? Um, and you hear a lot of people, and I'm sure it happens to you in your comments on things, people say you shouldn't eat too much red meat, you'll get diabetes. Everybody thinks that red meat and fat are going to cause diabetes. And and they say they're hearing that from their doctors. Um, and I just don't understand how something that doesn't have any sugar in it could cause diabetes, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, the thought is, I mean, and, and this is actually, there's, there is some, there is some rationale behind that thought. So is there? diabetes is not just about blood glucose. I mean, blood glucose, that's how we measure diabetes, right? But that's right. not the only thing that's going on. I mean, that's sort of an end stage effect. I mean, you can literally develop, uh, why do we care about diabetes? You know, we don't care, you know, we don't care that our blood glucose is hundred, 200, whatever. That's not the real concern. The concern is what is happening at the end of the end of the day at that stuff. We're going blind, our kidneys are failing, we're right. getting heart disease, mm -hmm. dementia, erectile dysfunction, chopping off feet and toes. And I've yeah. done a bunch, I chopped off a whole bunch of feet and toes in my career. It's not, it's not fun stuff, believe me. Mm -hmm. But what we see is people can have normal blood glucose and still start developing some of these signs of diabetes peripheral neuropathy, gastroparesis, uh, hypertension, heart disease can, can occur, you know, in, in, ahead of the blood glucose problem. So blood glucose is a late finding in many cases. And so people say, well, you know, the insulin resistance is coming ahead of that. And of course we have pre-diabetes. To me, it doesn't matter if it's pre-diabetes, diabetes, you got diabetes, you got the pathophysiology that's going on. Right. And some of that has to do with uh, fat deposition within our organs and cells. And so when we have the accumulation of a product called ceramides, and Ben Bickman's nice to talk about this one. Mm -hmm. uh, they, you know, this is a this is a consequence of fat in the blood, and this is often something called palmitic acid. Palmitic acid is a type of saturated fat that our liver makes. Right, our liver makes it through de novo lipogenesis. Now, the problem with that is that that's part of the that's part of the story, and that's the story that the vegans will tell. Well, fat in your blood is going to cause insulin resistance and lead to this diabetes. That part is actually true. Okay. The problem is dietary fat may not be doing it. You know, in fact, okay. Jeff, Jeff Volick has shown in a, in a series of studies that high levels of saturated fat in the diet are not correlated with high levels of saturated fat in the blood. So they conveniently leave those studies out. They say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Where's this palmitic acid coming from? What's coming from the liver? Well, how's the liver making it? Well, it's usually excess of something. It could be, it's carbon atoms. It could be, it could be in the form of carbohydrates. It could be in the form of fructose. It could be in the form of fat. It could be in the form of uh, polyunsaturated fats. But I mean, so it's more of, Am I over consuming? Am I eating too much that's making my liver spit out all this sort of 
extra fats and my cells are accumulating it. And so there's, there's this thought that everybody that eats meat, you know, is a, is a, is a guy that goes to McDonald's and gulps down sugary drinks and French fries. And that's true for most people. Honestly, it is. I mean, most people that consume saturated fat in the United States, you know, the interesting thing is the saturated fat consumption in the United States, if we look at it, only about 3% of the saturated fat calories that we consume as Americans comes from unprocessed whole meat. Like my diet, I eat pretty much all steak. I'm like right. only 3% of the, 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 the normal saturated fats come in that form for most Americans. Most Americans get most of the saturated fat from desserts, pizzas, lasagnas, prepackaged foods, cookies, cakes, because you think about it, cookies and cakes, butter, cream, eggs. Yeah. So that's the problem with, with this whole sort of sort of scenario. It's just, you know, where's the fat coming from? What is it? What, what else is it? What else is it presented with? And you know, as you probably know, when you eat a steak, particularly a fatty piece of meat, for many people, in fact, most people, it's fairly satiating. You know, I had two, mm -hmm. I had two New York strips for breakfast today. I'm pretty full. I'm still, I mean, I worked out hard. I'm not that hungry. I might have a small bit of food tonight, but I'm, mm -hmm. I'm good with that. You know, and, and if I'm, if I were eating carbohydrates, you know, if I were eating even bread, whole grain bread, I would be hungrier and I would eat more right. and I would tend to overeat. That's just me. And my liver would get fatter and I would, I would circulate more fat, saturated fat in my blood. And then I would probably accumulate it in my cells and I would become more an insulin resistant. So there's, again, there's some like associative data. Yes. If you look at a meat eater versus an unhealthy, I don't care about my health meat eater versus I'm on a plant-based diet and I care about my health, healthy mm -hmm. user bias. I mean, we say it all the time. And so you have to look at what does it mean to eat meat? Is there, a, I, I talked to uh, Garth Davis in a debate about this and he was talking about there's fat be there's plenty of fat vegans, right? They eat Oreo cookies, they drink Coke, mm -hmm. they eat plant-based crap, you know, whatever cheeses, all this process garbage their fat. Why is that? Well, he says, well, there's a healthy plant-based index, you know, where it's like we're eating whole unprocessed plant foods. We don't have that for meat eaters. All we have is standard Western diet as a meat eater. Now, if you were to say, I'm going to eat, I'm going to eat a burger patty. I'm not going to eat the bun. I'm not going to eat the fries. I'm not going to eat the Coke. I'm not going to eat processed meat that comes with you know, some kind of syrupy sauce with mm -hmm. soy product, sugar, MSG, garbage, garbage, garbage. If we, if we separate that out and say just steaks, just unprocessed ground beef, just mm -hmm. some fish, some chicken, some eggs, that is a very, very different effect on the body yes. than the standard Western diet. I believe so. Mm -hmm. I see it every day. I mean, I see it right. every day in people that go on a carnivore diet. They just, they, you know, they get better. Their, their diabetes goes away. Yeah. Yeah. And you look at, like you just mentioned, those studies, I think people don't know, they see the headlines, you know, that meat causes heart disease and meat, you know, causes all these things, but the meat that they use in those studies is like you just said, it's the burger with the bun and the fries and the drink. It's the pizza with meat on top. And they consider that to be the meat. And that's not fair, right? Because that's not we're what we're talking about here. When we're talking about meat being healthy, that's not the meat we're talking about. We're not eating our steak and having some rolls and mashed potatoes with it. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, and again, this is, you know, Univer Washington University, uh, 20, gosh, 2021, 2022, big study, you know, the headline was, you know, meat does not cause cardiovascular disease, does not cancer, does not cause cancer. And all the studies that have suggested it uh, that do are based on shoddy methodology, just this poor association. That's really what we have. We have crappy, we just have crappy science that's not mm -hmm. very powerful. And right. the advocates were saying, well, it's tough to do good science. It costs much, a lot of money. It's unethical. It's, it's time consuming. That's the best we have. And that's what we're going to make the recommendation. For me, that's just not good enough. It's just like, right. well, I have questions. What if, what about this variable and that variable? Well, we don't know. It's too hard to see, you know, right. and, and it's kind of funny. You got, got guys like Chris Gardner. He's, he's a PhD out of Stanford. You know, he did the twin study on Netflix. Mm -hmm. He's literally up there saying it's unethical to study a carnivore diet. And I'm like, look, man, there are already at this point, hundreds of thousands of people yeah. doing this diet. You might as well freaking study it. Right. You know, in my view, it's like, yeah. I'd I mean, volunteer. Yeah. I, you know, we got plenty of people. He's, right. like, well, he's, he's like, do you think you get people that could actually, would actually do this study? I said, Hell yeah. In fact, I mean, I'm, I'm in the process behind the scenes, getting a lot of these studies done. It's hard. I mean, it's, it's like yeah. pulling teeth. I gotta, I gotta, you know, I gotta, it's uh, in fact, I got a research meeting tomorrow morning with, with one big study that's going to be done. And then I've got another one I'm working on and our company Rivero, uh, we are going to be doing studies on carnivore. You know, we, we just raised some more money to do that. So we're going to be doing lots of studies on some of this stuff. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, 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 you know, like I said, I think, I think we, we just, you know, anytime there's a study out there, the number one question you should say is, well, one of the, one of the important questions is, 
does that represent me and what I do? Or is it different than what I do? And if it's different than what you do, then it doesn't apply. So it doesn't apply right. to me because that's not me. Yeah, absolutely. So for all the naysayers that are out there saying, why won't you just eat some vegetables? Because I get that a lot. And I know you do too. Why won't you just eat some vegetables? What's ro- wrong with broccoli? What's wrong with potatoes? Why can't you just eat those with your meat? I did. I did for years. And right. I, was, I was sicker. I mean, right. that's, that's a simple answer. Mm-hmm. Well, vegetable, I don't really like most vegetables. I mean, potatoes are okay, mm-hmm. uh, but I don't like that. I never liked vegetables my whole life. Yeah. I hate tomatoes. I hate onions. I hate peppers. Really? I, mean, I just hate those things. I mean, yeah. there were some that I could gag down. And you know, I remember yeah. the, I'm, the last vegetable I ate was in 2006 in France and it was a Brussels sprout. And I don't miss them at all. They don't right. do anything for me. You know, I mean, I, it's kind of funny the other day, not the other, a couple, uh, about two months ago, I did a little experiment where I included some apples because I was playing with this cholesterol thing. I wanted right. to see, because Nick Norwich did his little Oreo yeah. experiment. I was like, I don't eat much Oreos. Let me just do apples. And I ate apples for a week, you know, and I hadn't done that in years. I mean, there's probably more apples that I'd eaten in, in one week than I had in 10 years, right? So I ate like three or four apples a day, 100 grams of carbs a day. And it didn't really have a big Im- impact on my my cholesterol. But what it did do is my gut just started hurting. You know, after about four or five days in, I was like, oh man, my guts are just not feeling that good. And I had to stop after, I wanted to do it for two weeks. And after about seven, eight days, I was like, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. I just feel too bad. So, I mean, that's, I just don't like them. I don't like them. They, I, I feel good. I mean, I already enjoy what I eat. I don't miss vegetables. Um, I mean, if I'm going to eat something, I would rather have a piece of chocolate cake, to be honest. I mean, and I, sometimes I do. I, and once, and I mean, I mean, rarely, I mean, I'm talking like, once, twice, maybe three times a year, I'll have like mm-hmm. a piece of cake or something like that. Right. But that's it. I mean, I don't really want it that much. I mean, I, I literally don't really want this stuff. And it, and that's right. really the cool part that is like, before I was like, my, my model used to be eat dessert before, before you never eat dessert first, because you never know right. you're going to yeah. die. It's like, at least like, like I'm right? Yeah. So I, but now I'm like, hey, you know, I don't really want that stuff. So it's, it's right. kind of funny how, how it changes. And it really does. And because the people that, that are like, I could never do caramel because I could never give up. Yeah. whatever, pizza, bread, yep. pasta, cookies, every cream. day. It's like, I don't want that stuff anymore, right. which is, which is cool. I mean, I want steak. I can tell you that I'm addicted right, yeah. to steak. I call that a steak addiction. I got that for sure. Yeah, me too. I had somebody tell me today when I told them that the reason I didn't eat vegetables is because they kept me inflamed and bloated. And, you know, I just wasn't healthy when I was eating vegetables. They said it was because I wasn't chewing them enough. And I was like, maybe that's it. Maybe you just put them in a blender, right? Put them in the smoothie yeah. blender, right? Yeah, me too. Or and I, I used to make my family drink celery juice every morning because I thought it was healthy. It's just a little bit ridiculous, <laughs> right? So um, I want to talk about Ansel Keys real quick. Okay. Ansel Keys is kind of the mastermind behind the low fat craze and the um, food pyramid and why we are so afraid of meat and fat is because he said he thought that meat and fat is what made us fat and sick. And then did some studies, traveled around the world, and he did the seven country study. You want to talk about that real quick, that it wasn't actually seven countries? Yeah, well, I mean, that's, you know, I mean, he he apparently had data on 22 countries and he kind of cherry picked the seven that fit his hypothesis, you know, so that, you know, he, he, you know, he didn't follow the data. He made the data follow his hypothesis, I suppose, with regard to that study. And I, you know, he's obviously put, you know, cited as one of the instigators of the whole Die hard hypothesis that kind yes. of was being, you know, 1950s. Eisenhower has a heart attack. Everybody's heart disease is was coming, going up for sure. I mean, yeah. I mean, at the same time, I mean, it's kind of funny because Eisenhower was reportedly smoking three packs of cigarettes a day, which, you know, at the mm-hmm. time we had doctors telling you smoke, you know, mm-hmm. doctors prefer camels. So yeah. we now know that that's yeah, terrible. I mean, probably if you're smoking three packs of cigarettes a day, that's probably what's driving the heart disease, not the fact that you're eating. Uh, butter and eggs. I mean, you know, but, 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 you know, that's, right. again, that's just, you know, I mean, he had a, he had a pretty powerful ego apparently. And, you know, he was right. Damn it. No matter what, and no matter what right. anybody else said. So he had a lot, he had some undue influence over, over nutrition science. And, and we've had, you know, even going back to the foundation, the American Dietetics Association back in 1917, founded by Seventh-day Adventists who are basically religious vegetarians. And so we have this anti, particularly red meat bias that's gone back hundred years, more than hundred years now. Yeah. And I just think it's really sad that people still believe that and follow that advice. And that is partially why we are sick and just keep getting sicker. And my prediction is that in the next, within the next 20 years, we are going to look at the food industry, the processed food industry, the same way we now look back at the tobacco industry where they got us addicted. They kept us addicted. And they made us sicker and sicker. So that's my my prediction. 
Well, I mean, we'll see. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I would like to, I'd like to see that happen. I mean, yeah, I, you know, again, it's so much, gosh, there's so much money in this stuff. I mean, it's back. RJ Reynolds ended up buying like Nabisco and they just mm -hmm. transferred all their, you know, their dirty tricks onto the food industry right. and we have the same thing. So they make food that's inherently addictive and, you know, wildly addictive to people. It's purposely designed that way and it's extremely profitable. And of course there's a whole drug industry, you know, pharmaceutical industry that profits on the fact that, uh, that people are sick. And, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, like I said, the drug, you know, you didn't really have good drugs for cancer, but, but you got, you got great drugs for chronic lifestyle disease, you know, diabetes drugs, hypertension, drugs, you know, cholesterol drugs. So you've got this, you've got this big, many, many trillion dollar industry that you have to sort of convince that they don't need to make their trillions of dollars anymore. And that's going to be a hard sell. Uh, yeah. there's going to be a lot of pushback. You know, it, it really pains me to see physicians out there, uh, sort of defending processed foods yeah. as if, as if, you know, what's well, an, an, it's inevitable. It's never going away. We might as well embrace it, you know, and hopefully them and hopefully the food manufacturers will be kind enough to make a little bit more healthy processed food. I, I think that's silly. I mean, it's just like, you know, it's, it's, it's like, it's like, you know, I hope the guy that beats me doesn't beat me as much or something like that. You know, it's just like, you know, I mean, you have to say, um, this is garbage. No. Nope. And just, that's it. You got to draw a hard line out. You can't just say, well, a little bit, a little moderation, never hurt anybody. You enjoy yourself. You only live once. All that stuff uh, is just why we have this problem. We have so many damn fat people, so many damn sick people, and it's going to get worse. And, you know, like I said, I can't, you know, I can't save everybody. I know that. And, you know, the ones that are whatever, lucky enough or smart enough to realize it will We'll do that. I just hope that there's enough of a, a pushback that there will be a protected industry that we can continue to eat in a healthy way because they're coming after the meat industry. They're they're trying to centralize the food mm -hmm. supply. They're trying to limit that. They're trying to, you know, we're going to save the planet by making a diet that's ultra processed food and very profitable. That's how we save the planet, you know, even though we mm -hmm. make a bunch of humans sicker. Yeah. And then I want to ask you something that you asked me when I was on your Rivero channel about if we found out, and I may not word it exactly the way you did, but it's something like, if we found out that meat actually was bad for us and it was causing us harm, would you give it up? Would I give it up? Uh, you know, I mean, you know, as far as potentially, yeah. I mean, if it depends how harmful it was, I mean, you know, if, mm -hmm. if, if, you know, and if you could demonstrate that this is somehow making me sick or, sh you know, definitely right. shortening my life. I don't know how you demonstrate that. Don't right. I? Certainly the last part. I mean, anybody that says, their diet is going to make you live longer. I always laugh. I'm like, you don't know that. There's no way you can. There's make no way to know. Possible to know. And so, because I was criticized for saying, I mean, this is funny. I got to criticize. A lot of people criticize me. I was on a show and I said, hey, I don't know if eating carnivore diet is going to make me live longer, live shorter, you know, get a disease, not get a disease. I don't know that for sure. Because mm -hmm. I don't. And I don't think anybody does about any diet. But right. that was, a, that was a source of, like, I'm supposed to have omniscient powers of prediction. And it's the only way I can right. make a recommendation. If I know definitively right. the outcome for every human on the planet and how long they're going to live, which no one yeah. could ever know. Uh, so, I mean, I'm happy to recommend carnivore diets because I think they yeah. help people. I mm -hmm. think people clearly get healthier when they do them in most cases, if not the majority of cases. And, and so I'm, I'm happy to make those recommendations, but I mean, you know, like I said, I said, I am not wedded to this diet. I'm not right. married yeah. to it. I'm not ideologically dogmatically attached to a carnivore diet. The only reason I do it, well, there's two reasons. One, I like meat, but two, it makes me work good, feel good. Right. And if it does do, if it doesn't do that for me, then why do it? I mean, what right. is the point, right? If, if right. you went on this diet and you got unequivocally sicker, don't do the damn diet. I mean, right. I mean, I, I'm not going to tell you to keep doing it. Don't just keep trying for 10 years. I mean, it's right, like yeah. you didn't do it right. If right. it doesn't work for you, go do something else. If it works for right. you, great. Do it and do it as long as you want. Yeah. And 30, 30 or 60 days isn't going to cause irreversible damage, but it might just change your life. It might make you feel a lot better. It might get you off your medications. It might lower your blood pressure. You might lose weight. You know, a lot of good things might happen. And if it wasn't good for you, you just go back to whatever you were eating before if you feel worse, right? I mean, it's not a big deal to try. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's always 30 day challenges. I like 90 days because I think that's that's yeah. realistically what what a lot of people need seem to need to 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 do that. But yeah, I mean, it's worth a try. I mean, it's kind of funny because you know all these people say, "Hey, I've been on a carnivore diet five years, seven years, ten years. I got zero calcium in my artery." And you know, all all the critical say, "Oh, it takes decades, maybe 50 years for heart disease to show up." And then they'll get a report of a guy that was on carnivore for two months and he has some sort of cardiac event. Just, oh my God, did you see that carnivore? right away it kills you right away it's just so funny uh, the the yeah. absolute you know 
sort of yeah. complete opposite of what they'll say. And yeah. you know, when you when you go into these guys like that have, you know, have had some kind of heart event, you're like, well, what was your history? Well, I had heart disease already. You know, it's like, okay, well, that yeah. sort of changes things a little bit. Uh, but yeah, it's it's uh, it's interesting. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, if 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 it were truly unhealthy for me, I wouldn't do it. I mean, that, that, right. that's the bottom line. I don't think anybody should. I mean, it, this, right. like I said, this is not an ideology. I'm not out to save the tomatoes or kill right. as many cows as possible. I'm, I'm mm-hmm. here to eat in a way that, you know, makes me as healthy as I can be or, or, or as close to it as possible. Right. Yeah. And then you have to look at if you're not going to just eat meat, what are you going to eat? Are you going to add in the vegetables that made you sick and made you not feel good? Or are you going to add in processed foods that are obviously not healthy for you? Right. I mean, like the meat has to be the right thing to eat. I mean, that's just my opinion on it is. And the more of us that feel good doing it and giving up all of those other foods, and the more we keep spreading the word, the more people we can share it with. Yeah, it's growing. There's no doubt about it. More and more people doing this, that's for sure. And then, you know, and the, only re- the only reason carnivore has gained you know, relative widespread, you know, utilization is because it works. You know, because, right. I mean, think about it. Who's going to give up all these other foods? I mean, right. why would you want to do that unless there was some significant benefit? That's right. Um, and, and there clearly is. Yeah. And meat, and, and meat tastes pretty damn good, too. Yeah, you are darn right. Dr. Baker, thank you so much for spending time with me tonight. This was really great. And hopefully we can save some people. Awesome. Thanks, Serena. I'll see you you so much. uh, See you in Tennessee in a couple of weeks. That's right. We'll see each other at that retreat. And thank you for watching. We'll see you next time on the Carnivore Revolution.